Welcome to Books on Air, the podcast that tells the story behind the book. It includes insights from authors about how they compose their work, what inspires them, and what they hope you'll take away from their book. Here's your host for this episode of Books on Air, Suzanne Harris. Welcome to the Books on Air podcast. I'm Sloan Fremont filling in for Suzanne Harris. This is a podcast where listeners get the secret story behind every book. Joining me today is Dave Lassam, author of the book, Meet Dave Lassam, The Man for the Job, My 39 Years of Service in the Royal Australian Navy. This is an account of Dave's life in the Royal Australian Navy and contains his memories of an awesome career that covers many subjects from his attendance to car accidents, reviving people who had heart attacks, working in disaster zones to give humanitarian aid, and so many other stories. So Dave, I wanna welcome you to the Books on Air podcast. Thank you very much. Great to be here. So let's start out by telling the audience just a little bit about yourself and what led you to write your book, Meet Dave Lassen, The Man for the Job. Um, okay. Um, for those of you who don't know Australia very well, I was born on the island of Tasmania, um, which is to the south of Australia, back in 1959, <laughs> um, a long time, long time ago. And we moved around a lot uh, with Dad's job. And um, I eventually... Uh, so I was sent to, school, sent to boarding school at one stage and that really annoyed me more than anything. <laughs> and I ended up going and living with mum, who moved on by that time. And I got through school, did all my schooling and decided that I was going to join the Navy. Not quite sure why, mm -hmm. but the way it worked out was a few mates of mine and I decided to go down to the recruiting office and they were all happy. They wanted to join as pilots and do all this whiz-bang stuff. And I didn't have any clue. Anyway, we went and did the exams and I'm the only one that got in. And uh, <laughs> so, so um, a couple of months later, um, the police came and got me, as they do, because I lived in the country at that time and they had to find me because I was working on a chook farm. Mm -hmm. And suddenly I was in the Navy and away we went from there. So I basically, uh, from out, basically straight out of school into the Navy, mm -hmm. something that I thought I was not going to survive after the first couple of weeks you're sitting there going oh this is so difficult mm -hmm. um but then it sort of became easier and easier and as it, as i went along i just found it was just so great and uh i just kept going and going and going and mm -hmm. into 39 years yeah so 39 years yeah so tell us about your your um experience what was a typical day like was there a typical day or was everything different um what was it like for uh you well, it could be. Some days could be as boring as anything, and that's in any job, I suppose. Yeah. But um, when you're under training as a, in, in the Navy where you train a lot, um, as you'd expect, something different every day. And it was either learning about the history of the Navy to start with, how to fire weapons, how to do first aid, and those sorts of things. And once you've done your basic training, you went into what we call the category training. The category training is what you want to be, and I wanted to be a medic. Well, that's okay. what they picked, they picked for me to be a medic, actually. They said, we reckon you would make a good medic. And, um, of course, I went, okay. And, uh, <laughs> Is that so what was, you wanted to do or did you want to do something I, else? Well, I wasn't sure when I started, but when, yeah. you, when they talk to you, the recruiters are very good. They pull out of you your background. And my mum used to work in a hospital. My grandfather was an air raid warden during World War II and they did mm -hmm. the first day of stuff. So they sort of built on that and said, and got me interested in doing that because I wore glasses as well. That limited, I couldn't oh, okay. be flying and stuff per se. I couldn't fly jets or anything else, not that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. But that sort of does uh, lower the number of um, things you can do. And once I got into it, I found I, I really, really enjoyed it. And I did very well um, in the medical training. I top my course um, for that for that season, and then I went. And once you've done your training, you do a uh, hands-on stuff, of course. Mm -hmm. and, and away it went. And basically then they post yeah. you around to wherever you need to go. And so did you stay as a medic the whole time, your whole yeah, service? The, whole, the, whole, the first 10 years, I was a hands-on medic, mm -hmm. um, clinical. And then I had the option, and it was suggested by my <laughs> superiors, that I try the officer corps. And these were the guys who ran the medical things like we were in charge of medical school or uh, and did administered hospitals. So I decided to change over officer um, in 1988. So I'd done about 10 years, I say normal medic, and then yeah. become 
an administrator. And at that stage, we didn't do much like go to sea because that's just the way it was. And then they changed the way things were and said, no, if you're in the Navy, you've got to be fit to go to sea. And they started sending administrators to sea. And I went, mm -hmm. and when I went, they went to some amazing um, things that were going on uh, overseas. There were, there were coups going on everywhere in the Pacific. And I would attend those as, as being in charge of a medical unit at points. Mm -hmm. Um, and we did some pretty amazing things while we were on there. So uh, it sort of was that. It was running hospitals, running the medical training for the Navy, and then going to sea and doing mm -hmm. stuff. Like that, and when you went out then, were you did you go all over the world or were you in certain areas? Well, or Oh, no. Well, mainly our area of interest, of course, is the, is the Pacific, the Southwest mm -hmm. Pacific um, and the Indian Ocean. So I ended up uh, in East Timor, um, in Indonesia, doing relief work after the uh, tsunami, mm -hmm. and then um, a, a year after we were helping the, and then we went with the Americans. Well, I did, and a t small team with the USNS Mercy um, into that area as well to do assistance stuff. I ended up in the Middle East twice, mm -hmm. uh, in the sand, in the sand rather than at sea, uh -huh. uh, uh, and that was to help with building a new hospital for defence in the UAE and designing all that and working at the manpower and doing a whole lot of other things. And I did that twice. Uh, the second time was for um, organising combat first aid mm -hmm. for Australians back in the UAE as well. So I had a lot of various jobs, which, to be honest with you, when you first look at it, I had no idea what I was <laughs> doing. You go, oh, okay, Middle East, never been there, but what do we do? Um, but they train you and they make sure yeah. that you're – what to go and then once you get there it all just fell into place um of course it's always a big thing when you, somebody tells you you're going to the middle east and go yeah oh, okay yeah. thanks for that but yeah. I, I would not turn it change anything in that it was just so brilliant to be part of it it was right it was great yeah so 39 years of your career so let's go let's go get into the book a little bit tell us why you decided to write about it um and how you got there to actually writing the book well, it all start, started way back. I also decided many years ago to do something else besides Navy. And, and just because doing Navy all the time can drive me nuts if you're yeah. bored. Yeah. So, uh, we, my other half and I decided to do dog, dog showing. Mm -hmm. Get out there. Can't do it while you're at sea. I know that. But, mm -hmm. um, when I was in port, I could do it and she could do it when I wasn't there. And, as a part of that and getting into it, I, and nobody really who I talked to really knew much about defence and the Navy, so I would talk mm -hmm. about it all the time. Mm -hmm. And every time something would happen um, medically and then I had been in attendance to, I'd tell them, I was going home the other day in a car accident and I did all this and they were sort of all a bit gobsmacked about it. And it wasn't until probably the day that somebody literally died in the dog show ring and then I revived them and got them back that wow. everybody went, Ooh, wow. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> he, he's, he can do stuff. Um, yeah. Not that it was it was just automatic, and I went in and I did it. Yeah. My life. Anyway, um, with all the stories I've been telling about things, people say oh, look, one thing is people say, "Oh, you should write a book." Mm -hmm. And you go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." You know yeah. how it is. Anyway, by the end of my career, I had done a lot and seen a lot, and I thought I'm going to write a book. And um, it didn't sort of go quite as well as I hoped to start with because I sort of sat down the first week on I've retired or been retired medically. I got quite ill and they said, well, enough's enough. And I sat down I wrote a paragraph and then I didn't touch it for two years. Um, and then once I got back into it, um, it slowly built. And you build, in my book, you built it in chunks because that's how your career was. Between this yeah. year and this year you were here, then you moved to here. With you. So it was quite easy to follow. And I could remember all that stuff. It was just you remember your postings and then you, you pick up what you've done in those postings. So yeah, basically, basically it was at the request of, of my civilian friends who knew nothing about it. And those that I've spoken to so far who have read it think it's just like a conversation with me, which is what I wanted it to do. So it's not yeah. over technical or uses too many um, heavy slang words that people don't understand. Right. Um, even though I put them in the back so you can look, oh, what did he say? Um, <laughs> yeah, because sometimes I do. Um, yeah, so that was that's why I started. That's why I had the idea of doing it. 
And so tell us some of your favorite scenes you covered in the book. Um, I think, well, the one that really sticks out in my mind, and it was not until I'd been in about 20 years, so it had been a fair while. Um, it, it was huge. It was the Bali bombings back in um, 2002. Mm-hmm. And uh, as you're aware, it was after 9-11. You got the American thing happened, And then the next year, the October of the next year, they had the Bali bombings and 202 people were killed and 88 of them were Australians. And at the time, I was in Darwin. And as as being in Darwin, where it is in the north of Australia, our protectorate medically was all the top of Australia and outwards. And, of course, we were the nearest point to Bali um, and we had to get uh, all the assistance up to Darwin and staged through Darwin to Bali to get the injured back. Mm-hmm. And it, my the, the story goes into how my part in that, and I had a large part in it. I was uh, administering everything. Make sure the aircraft came in, they had the crews, and they had the stuff and the gear. And when the planes came back, we had all the ambulances ready to go and all that sort of stuff. And then, and working closely with the Royal Darwin Hospital, then twenty four hours later, we had to turn around and then send all the patients out to other capital cities in Australia to uh, because we didn't. Darwin was it's only a small city. Mm-hmm. There's about I think there's about 250,000 people there or something. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not very big at all, but the hospital and the hospital wasn't really prepared for it. They are now. And they've got all new bits and pieces, but that came afterwards. Um, and just helping those people and talking to them and, and, and my part in just making them as comfortable as possible. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards I've uh, kept in contact with some of them because mm-hmm. I felt pretty... I used the word crap after uh, that. I, it was starting, my start of my PTSD was then, and I didn't know that, of course, at yeah. the time. I just felt that, and I decided that when I moved again to get in touch with them, and I'm still in touch with them today. Mm-hmm. So um, I went and met a couple I hadn't seen in a long time and gave them copies of the book and uh, met their families. And I, they were, and I used the word, they were really only alive because the ADF, had helped yeah. to, them to survive. And that, I felt yeah. really proud of that. That was um, really cool. And as I said, they've got families and we talk on um, uh, social media all the time. Yeah, I mean, that's such an amazing, I mean, obviously terrible. Nobody wants to be in it. But when you play the part of um, saving people, saving their lives, I mean, that is that is um what was that like to remember that and and those kinds of events where you've saved people's lives i mean i don't know it, it seems like words that might get said but maybe not understand the gravity of how how big that is you know well, well look it is big and and i've done it a few times and, and i've i've done um in dog shows i've done six cprs in the field and all of them survived wow. um for some period of time and that was due to the fact that my training kicked in and yeah. I took up from the people who didn't know what they were doing right. to help and got it done. Um, I, I try not to big note myself about it because that's my training and that's what I do, but it's an amazing feeling when you come out of it because you're working on adrenaline. It doesn't matter who you are, yeah. you're working on adrenaline and when it's over, um, you obviously come down off that. And I'm, very, I'm usually very uh, critical of myself in what I did because um, I take notes while I do it, and they are specifically for the patient. But I also take notes that say, what later when I look back and go, oh, hang on, you need to improve that. Um, that's just me. I'm very yeah. with how I do stuff. But the feeling is is magical, and it lasts yeah. with you. There's a euphoria that goes with that. And I still remember the main ones uh, to this day. It doesn't matter what, where, where I was, I still remember what I was doing when it happened. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've had heart attacks at dog shows, as I said, that and people who I know have literally died in front of me and I've managed to get them back um, and that sort of thing. And then I get all the little things that happen at dog shows, like, um, hey, somebody's been bitten by a dog. Like, uh, yeah, yeah. All, uh, and I go and, and I just do that. Um, that's because I'm, I, I would never turn anyone away sort of thing. Yeah. But it's, yeah. it's happened to me in the street as well, which is really... <laughs> be walking down the street and somebody claps in front of you go oh here we go again yeah and then you just it just your training takes over and you do what you know how to do 
And even though, even though I know that, funnily enough, my PTSD will pick up and uh, I, it always does it afterwards. I know what's going to happen to me later. I don't mind. I get in and do the job. When it's safe and everybody's done, I'll probably have the big high and then I'll crash a bit. And I know that's coming because that's how it works. Um, but I don't care. I'd rather be uh, able to do and, and be able to help someone and make their day a better day, for want of a better term, than leave them sitting there with no one helping them. So it's just me. Yeah. Yeah. And so the PTSD comes after the yeah. experience of that. Yeah. 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 And it can happen a week later, mm-hmm. um, a couple of days later, and it just is a real bummer um, with me. I just tend to withdraw totally and curl up in a ball. Um, but it can, it can, it can be very, it can be very horrible actually. Um, and I do talk about that quite a fair bit in the book as well because it's, I'm quite open about it. I've got it. That's the way it is. And this is what I do. And, um, just try to make it a little bit more bearable and palatable for mm-hmm. people. Well, cause I was an officer in the Navy. Well, an officer's out there and he's saying he's had it. Then it can't be wrong for me as a young sailor. That's my big thing because. You join as a sailor, you want a career in the Navy for however long, and suddenly you've got PTSD because of something that's happened to you in the Navy. Right. You don't want to lose your job. You're a bit scared, so people don't report it as much, and that right. just makes it worse. Right. If you, get, if you get the treatment and they look after you and they catch you early, not a problem. Right. And, and you, know, like you, you, um, you know that about yourself now. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there would, I mean, I obviously don't have it, but it would seem like in the denial of it or trying to pretend like you don't have it would make it even that much worse and harder to manage and deal with. And so knowing that about yourself and knowing how you experience it, um, I think it it seems like that would be more beneficial than hiding it. Absolutely. And uh, I've been through all the treatment processes and have the medication and do all that sort of stuff. Um, but even even all that, sometimes you just get really down and with yeah. it. I know that. And if I can pick the thing that's made, that's caused it, I go, okay, that was it. If I can't, I say, well, I don't know, but try to just mellow. And, and I know it's the way they are out in front of the telly and, and, and don't do too much. Yeah. Because if I push myself too hard, it just makes, makes it worse. But yeah. I know I can get through it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you're um, just listening to you talk about it and doing these things, you know, saving lives um, is to me just so amazing because I, I've, I've never done that. I don't know, but I would be the person standing by wanting to help somebody, but having no clue how to do any of it. So I think uh, you telling us that story and, and, you know, writing about it in your book so that um, others can understand that perspective too, because I think a lot of times, you know, we, we know people are there to help. And I think, you know, sometimes we take it for granted that people are, but everybody can be that person, right? Everybody can be the person that does, you know, something to help. Absolutely. Doing something is better than doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And nowadays with all the new uh, equipment and that, that you can get, I've, um, I'm a member of what we call in Australia, the good Good Samaritan. Um, I'm a member of what's called Good Samaritan. Now that doesn't, it's not a religious order or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It's a, I'm attached to the Victoria Ambulance Service so that if their ambulances can't get to something like a serious cardiac arrest and for some reason the ambulances are all tied up and I live in a little bit more of the country sort of area, mm-hmm. then they will call me at whatever time. A siren will go off on, on my phone. I'll be woken rudely from my bed. And yeah. If it's within a radius of however kilometres I say I can handle, say 10 k's, I will get in my car and I'll carry my own um, uh, AUD, so the automatic yeah. fibrillator with me, and I'll bolt to a house. And I'll go to that house and say, listen, I'm a good Samaritan. I've got the gear. The ambulance is coming, but I can, I can help now. Yeah. And then I've, and I've done that three times so far. Wow. Um, which has been a bit exciting. <laughs> and uh, I've actually been, I'm now part of a new trial with the new AED, which is about as big as, oh, better show my book. It's actually not, it's about that wide. Uh-huh. 
that long and it's a little AD which fits in my bag so I carry it everywhere I go. I've got one on me. Right. Now that, that's just what the idea there is to is to see the survival rate of people who get almost instantaneous things. So if I come across in a shopping centre and it happened not long ago, <laughs> um, an old lady had uh, been walking along to the 80 and mm-hmm. a couple of young kids inadvertently ran into her and knocked her over and oh. she hit, hit the deck pretty hard and she was lying on the floor and there were a bunch of people around her and when I got there, I, I missed that bit and I got there a couple of minutes later and um, they all sort of, I just tell them I'm a Navy medic and everybody gets out of my way <laughs> and I went down I did all the things and talked and I lay on my stomach and I was talking to her because she was flat on the ground Mm-hmm. And we lay there for two hours before the ambulance got there. Oh, my gosh. And we just talked and, and did stuff. Yeah. So she's fine now. Um, you know, I didn't move her and made sure no one else moved. We kept her warm, did all those sorts of things. And I run into her all the time in the shopping centres. <laughs> oh, yeah. I get it. And, and so, you know, and that's, that's probably the best thing is when you get that response, you know that what you've done has helped. Yeah, um, I didn't save a life on that day, but I was there to help, and that's the yeah. main thing because she was she was frightened. She yeah. hit the ground hard. She hit her head on the floor. Um, it was a bit cold. Um, she had lots of people around, but a lot of people standing around doesn't always help. Yeah, that I imagine that would make it worse being watched and having the experience just happen. It probably feels a little too much. Not where you want to be on the spot. <laughs> no, it's not most embarrassed. More, it's a lot yeah. more. It's embarrassment. Because yeah. you've done something silly. But, yeah. you know, it's life. Yeah. You chip over, you fall over. Yeah. <laughs> but again, yeah, so you're, you're just listening to your talk is, is just so interesting. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. So um, I'm going to get ready to wrap us up here. But um, before we close up today, what do you hope the readers learn or take away after reading your book? Well, I just hope that they take away one look. The Australian Defence Force and any Defence Force is contains a lot of people who do some absolutely brilliant things. That was one of my main things. Was to, yeah. and I know that the Australian Defence Force is not at times can be silly, <laughs> can be silly as long as others do. They do some silly things. And go, mm-hmm. yeah. However, the people in it are, are what make it work. And I'm just trying to make it clearer to people how we do work and what we do. Mm-hmm. And also the outside stuff that we do. Um, yeah. And I've been a part of, and I know my colleagues have been a part of it as well. So that I just hope they get that look, uh, any bloke or girl um, from anywhere, doesn't matter what stream of life, if you decide to serve in your defence force, you can make a huge difference to lots of different people. No, and it's not only about going to war; it's about other stuff that we do as well. So I yeah. hope that. Yeah, and Dave, I want to thank you for joining us. Dave's the author of the book "Meet Dave Lassam, the Man for the Job: My Thirty-Nine Years of Service in the Royal Australian Navy." Uh, such an interesting story; we could talk for hours. Um, thank you again, Dave, for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. You can find more about the book, Meet Dave Lassam, the Man for the Job, on Amazon, and I'll link to the book in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. You've been listening to the Books on Air podcast brought to you on webtalkradio.net. You can also hear this podcast on Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, and Apple Podcasts. I'm Sloan Fremont, and I hope you'll join us for the next Books on Air podcast. Remember, you never know who's going to be here, and you never know what we're going to talk about. Thank you so much for listening.